Okay. Welcome everyone to the class on Romans. Uh, praise the Lord and welcome Rosalind and Jeffina. Thank you for joining class. We also want to uh, welcome all our e-learning students who will be listening to uh, this lecture later on. Uh, welcome Zella Toli. Glad to have you in class uh, this morning. Um, before we begin, let's just pause for a word of prayer and ask uh, Jeffina to lead us in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class that we are about to have. But we bless uh, Selena, ma'am, and I bless all my classmates who are here, who are about to join, and who will be listening to it later. God, as we are uh, learning the deepest truth, truths in the Bible, God, I just pray that you will help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and accept it in our heart and live by the word so that we can glorify you on this life, Jesus. Let everything that we learn help us to put into praxis, practice, Lord. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Jeffina. So um, on Friday, we began uh, studying Romans chapter 8. We studied verses 1 to 10. Basically, Romans chapter 8 is a very beautiful chapter for us as believers. It's telling us how we need to live in the provision of the identification. Uh, we looked at our, uh, our spiritual identification, our true identification, who we are in Romans chapter 5 and 6. The identification that God has made provision for us. And... Um, you know, God is saying, I have done this for you, and he has provided this for us through Jesus Christ. But Romans chapter 8 tells us how we need to walk in this uh, experientially. And so he, you know, goes on to talk about how, you know, the answer for us to overcome the deeds of the flesh uh, uh, or overcome the weakness in the flesh that he mentions in Romans chapter uh, six and seven, he says it is through the Holy Spirit. Okay, then he talks about uh, he differentiates between the law of sin um, and the, the the law of the spirit of life. Uh, he also talks about uh, how to live according to the flesh and how to live according to the spirit. Uh, he talks about how to be carnally minded, which is en enmity with God, and he uh, how he talks about. Uh, you know, uh, to be spiritually minded, which brings life and uh, peace and is also something that we can please God when we are living um, in the uh, spirit. Okay, So these are the uh, things that we looked at in um, verses 1 to 10. And he says that, you know, um, if we are in Christ, then our body is dead to sin. But if we have the spirit of life in us, you know, we live according to uh, righteousness, okay? But if uh, uh, we are living according to sin, then sin brings death and decay and every kind of corruption in our body. Uh, but it says the spirit of him who raised, uh, but the spirit that of life that is living in us helps us to live uh, the life in the spirit or the God kind of life or the life that God has uh, purpose for us is purchased for us on the cross okay so that was uh romans chapter 8 verses uh 1 to 10 very briefly okay so going back to verse 10 he says and if if christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit of life because of uh, righteousness so in verse 9 he says the spirit of christ is in you and in verse 10, he says, Christ is in you. So here uh, we basically see a new title for the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. Uh, it means all who Christ is to us is, uh, is the Holy Spirit or, or who the Holy Spirit is to us. It means all who Christ is to us, the Holy Spirit is to you and to me. And the Holy Spirit brings Jesus to you and to me. So in verse 10, he says, Christ is in you. So how is Christ in you and me? Christ is in you and me by his spirit. And he says, if Christ is in you, he says, the body is dead because of sin, which means if Christ is in us, so the Holy Spirit is in us, my body 
you know, because of sin has, which has death working in me, sin has produced death in my body, sin has caused death to work in my body, but if Christ is in me, you know, my body is dead uh, because of uh, sin, okay? But the spirit is life because of righteousness, which means in my spirit, I have received the righteousness of God, therefore I have the life in the spirit or life from the Holy Spirit, okay? So that was uh, just briefly a recap of what we did last week. We will move on to verse um, uh, 11 now. We will look, we will study verses 11 onwards uh, today. So can somebody read verse 11, please? Can somebody read verse 11? But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, this is my favorite verse, and this is a very, very powerful verse. I don't know if you have spoken this verse over your life, but I've spoken this verse over my life, and it is a very, very powerful verse. Prayed it over people uh, who are sick, and, you know, this is such a powerful verse. So here we see that, you know, verses 10 and 11, uh, verses 10 and 11 are connected. It says, Christ is in you because the spirit of Christ is in you, okay? It says, sin has been working in our body. So the body is dead or the body is dying. Uh, not that it is dead in the sense that it is lifeless, that means, it just means that the body is dead, means that the death has been working in our body, okay? Death has been working in our body. That's why we see corruption, decay, frailty, weakness, uh, sickness. Um, and that is why the body, he says, is dead. But he says the spirit is life. So in your spirit, you have the life, okay? You have the life of God in your spirit. So in your body, because sin is at work, you know, death is in work in us. But because the Spirit of God is in us, you know, God gives life to our mortal bodies. Okay. So even though sin is at work in our body and, you know, death is at work in us, but because we have uh, the Spirit of God in us, you know, God gives life to our mortal body. So our body is mortal it is death doomed which means that eventually we are all going to die one day but while we are living here on the earth because the spirit of god himself is living in you and me you know the spirit of life is in you and me god is giving life to our mortal bodies amen okay so god is giving life to my death doomed body Okay, and this connects us back to Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Okay, remember we said when we're studying, we have to have the backward look and the forward look. Okay, so this connects us back to Romans chapter 8, verse 2. It says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, so it's saying that sin has been producing death in us. So while our body is mortal and will die one day, the Holy Spirit is giving life to our mortal bodies. Okay, this is a, and and this is a scripture that is used for healing for our physical bodies. The Spirit of life is giving life to my mortal body, which means every single cell in my body is happy and well because. The spirit of life is giving life to every single cell in my body. Amen. So if you are in a place where, you know, you're facing some uh, sickness, it can be a terminal sickness, whatever, or, you know, somebody is very sick in your family, you know, uh, your friends, or, you know, you're praying for somebody, you know, just declare this Romans chapter 8 verse 11. It's a very, very powerful uh, verse. 
you know, I remember uh, during COVID, one of our church members was um, uh, extremely unwell, admitted in hospitals. His parameters were very, very vital parameters, were not doing good. And um, the doctors, you know, the hospital, they tried their best. And uh, one fine morning, you know, um, uh, he was just lying there on the bed and, um, you know, the doctors came and they saw that his uh, his parameters of his vital organs uh, was not doing well. And they were considering to shift him to Velo Hospital, which is a, a big hospital. So he knew that, you know, from their facial expressions and their talks and heard that, you know, we need to shift him to Velo, knew that things were not going too well. He was very anxious. He was very, very worried. And so he... Um, messages pastor and pastor sends him this Romans chapter 8 verse 11 and he says when he was giving his testimony he says that this is the first time he's reading this verse and he realized how powerful um, this verse was and when he says when he just you know he's declared this verse over his life as a promise he says immediately there was such changes that happened you know his parameters were uh, his vital organs were doing good and slowly there was a lot of improvement and he came out of uh, COVID, uh, you know, alive. So uh, I have spoken this verse over my life in various instances, various circumstances, spoken this over people, I've seen healing. So extremely uh, powerful uh, verse. So, you know, um, so going back to Romans chapter 8 verse 2, he says, you know, sin has been producing death in our bodies so while our body is mortal and will die you know one day the holy spirit is going to give us life in this body so this you know we can declare this as a healing verse for our physical bodies that the spirit of life is giving life to our mortal bodies and every cell in our body every organ every nerve membrane tissue you know you name it in our body is happy and well because the spirit of life is giving life to every single cell in our body and we need to acknowledge that we need to acknowledge that the spirit of life in christ jesus you know has made me free from the law of sin and death okay so you and i should expect that till our dying moments we want the life that is coming from the holy spirit to fill our body so declare this over your, this verse over your life every day. Say, God, you know, till you want me to come back to you, till those dying moments, you know, of my life, I want, you know, my body, um, I want you to, you know, I want uh, the Holy Spirit to fill my body, to perfect my body, and to keep every single cell in my body well. Okay. Uh, can you, you can ask, can this be real? Yes, it can be real because this is God's word. We take him at his word. This is his promise because he says that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in me and the Holy Spirit that is dwelling in me is the spirit of life. And because he's a spirit of life, he gives life to our mortal bodies. So we can choose to believe it or we, we can choose not to believe it. We can choose to you know, accept it, choose not to accept it. We can choose to declare it as a promise, hold on to this promise and declare it. And, you know, uh, when we do that, when we declare this in faith, we can see God picking our mortal body through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit that dwells in me. Okay. Now, um, let's just take a small side journey and then we'll come back to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. Can uh, one of you please read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 11, please? Second Corinthians chapter 4. Yeah. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses uh, 10 to 11. Always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be shown in our body. For we who live are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be evidenced in our mortal body. Amen. So notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying the life of Jesus is manifested where? 
in our mortal bodies, in our earthly body. Okay, so in the same passage, he says that our outward man is perishing. He says, while this is happening at the same time, he's saying the life of Jesus is made visible in our mortal bodies. Amen. You know, um, we can say, you know, I am just working so hard for the kingdom of God. You know, my outward flesh, the body is uh, kind of perishing, is going weary. But at the same time, what is happening, the life of Jesus is made visible in our mortal bodies. And we must say, yes, Lord, you know, yes, let your life, the fullness of life, your Zoe life, the God kind of life, let it be visible in my body. So Paul is saying, while we are suffering in our body, in the midst of that, the life of Jesus is also made visible. Amen. Okay, let's look at another example in Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 21. An amazing uh, scripture passage. We can uh, just ponder and, you know, receive some insights from it. This is all like a side tour that we're taking. We'll come back to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But we are talking in line with what we are looking at in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Can somebody please read Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to 21, please? Uh, Acts chapter 14, 19 to 21. Then the Jews from Antioch and Lucanium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and met many disciples they returned to Lystra, Inconium and Antioch Amen uh, Sorry, I couldn't hear that because my um, audio thing was uh, muted so I had to unmute it Anyway, so did you read uh, Acts 14, 19-21? Okay, thank you So here we see that you know Paul, uh, thank you Zelotoli uh, Paul is traveling to the districts of uh, Galatia which is the southern part of modern day, day Turkey. And there were many cities uh, in Galatia, which is Antioch, Lystra, Derby, Iconium. And some people stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So the way they stoned him so badly that, you know, he's fallen unconscious and he is badly hurt. Imagine stoning a person, he's badly hurt, and they think that he is dead, and they drag him out to the city, and they leave him there, thinking that he is um, dead. Uh, so he says, you know, uh, we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 to 11, Paul says, you know, we are delivered to death for Jesus' sake, and we bear in our body the mark of Jesus Christ. So this is what he testifies in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. He says, Paul says, you know, we are, I'm constantly being delivered to death for Jesus' sake, and in my body I bear the marks of Jesus Christ. That means uh, all of these persecutions that he is going through is there in his body. So, you know, uh, it, uh, coming back to Acts chapter uh, 14, verses 19 to 21, it says when the believers came to Paul, you know, what, what happens? What do we read here? What do we read in the scripture? When the believers came to Paul, what happens? What does Paul do? He rose up and went into the city. Now, just imagine this. How can a man who has been stoned and, you know, the crowd and the mob thinking that he is, you know, almost dying, you know, drag him out and leave him there. And when the disciples come or the believers come, sorry, you know, he's able to rise up and walk into the city. Now, do you think that is humanly possible? He might be, you know, come back to conscience. Uh, he might become conscious of his environment and what is happening around him. He might come back to the state of being conscious. Uh, uh, but, you know, he would not be able to rise up and walk again. They might have to put him on a stretcher or they might have to carry him into the city. But what happens is 
Paul himself, you know, rose up and walked into the city. And don't you think that is strange? And something else strange, even more strange that happens, is the next day, what happens? What does, ha what does scripture say? The next day, he and Barnabas left to Derby and they went preaching and made disciples and they came back to the same city. Now, is this humanly possible? Now, even if somebody, you know, just beats you up, uh, leave alone, you know, uh, stony you, just beats you up and you're badly bruised and hurt, it will take you a couple of days at least for you to recoup and, you know, to come back um, to your normal self where you can function, where you can go and travel. And in those days, you know, they didn't have, um, you know, uh, flights and trains and uh, cars to transport them. You know, just imagine this man was beaten, left for dead. And what happens the very next day, he goes, travels with Barnabas to Derby, and he's preach. That's what he's preaching. He's not resting, he's preaching and he's making disciples, and he comes back to the same city. So this is humanly impossible. But what Paul is saying is he's saying, you know, like I quoted from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 10 to 11, he's saying, you know, we have been we are delivered to death. Every day we are bearing the marks of Jesus Christ in our body. But even though we're being delivered to death every day, the life of Jesus is manifested in us, which means he's saying the life of God, the spirit of life that is in me supernaturally gives me life, supernaturally heals me. And that is why, you know, we can't explain what happened when, when the disciples came around Paul, he he was conscious, he stood up and he walks into the city, which is humanly impossible. And then the very next day he travels and he goes into the next city and he's, uh, uh, he's preaching the gospel uh, over there. Okay, So, you know, there is no other explanation. Only explanation we can give, it had to be the life of God that brought about changes in his body, in his mortal body, in his physical body, brought about such supernatural healing. I don't know how it must have happened, but whatever God did, it, he enabled Paul to stand on his feet and go into the city and to travel the next day. Okay, so coming back to Romans chapter 8 verse 11, you know, Paul writes, God quickens our mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in us. And so I think when he's writing this, you know, of course, he's writing it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But also, I think he is speaking from his own experience, because there was numerous times when he was persecuted, when he was beaten, left for dead. You know, he bears the physical marks of persecution in his body. But, you know, he has the life of Jesus that is working in him. That's so amazing. That's so powerful. So when he's writing this in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, he knows what he is talking about. He knows that this God that he serves and the spirit of God that is in him is a life-giving spirit. God is giving him life in his mortal body and through his spirit that is living in us, God is giving us life. Amen. It's such a powerful verse. Okay. So based on Romans chapter 8 verse 11, you know, I want us to expect the spirit of life to touch our mortal bodies. Whatever can be the situation, whatever the doctors have said, whatever the reports, um, you know, the, uh, the test reports show us, you know, we can just declare and say, God, you know, let your life be visible in my body. Now, let your life be visible in my body. Even though my outward man seems to be perishing, you know, results say this, doctors say this, but at the same time, you know, the life of Jesus is made visible in our mortal bodies. Amen. Okay. So powerful words want you to hold on to this and declare it. So even when you are ministering to people, you know, you can tell them that the Holy Spirit that is in them is there for a reason. Now, there are many other reasons why the Holy Spirit is in us, but one of the things he does is he gives life to our mortal bodies or he quickens life in my mortal body through the life of the spirit that is there in us. So you can pray when you're praying and ministering healing to people. You don't know what to say. You can say, God, you know, touch their mortal bodies. Or you can say, God, touch my mortal bodies through the life of your spirit. Give life to my body.
Amen. Okay, so that was the powerful verse, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. I'd like you to, you know, dwell on it, uh, you know, ponder on it, make this a verse that is on your heart and your mind, uh, you know, and declare it and speak it over your life, your family, and your um, and loved ones, and see God coming through, uh, just like we see Paul you know, coming through and the supernaturally, the, the life of God just being manifested in his body. Okay, we'll move on. Any questions anyone has? Oh, any questions? Okay, there are no questions. Um, we'll move on to verses 12 to 17. Can somebody please read verses 12 to 17, please? Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So what is the conclusion to all that you know, Paul has spoken so far? He says in verse 12, therefore, which means Paul is saying, okay, I told you all this, so let's now sum it up, okay? So we need to remember that, you know, Paul is speaking through the brethren, he's speaking to the believers, and he says here that we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, okay? So he says when our flesh cries out for attention, or when our flesh is craving for attention, you know, or when the flesh is crying out and being dominating and powerful, we need to tell the flesh that, hey, I don't owe you anything, okay? I, 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 I don't have to pay you any um, attention. So we don't have to give in to the desires and to the drives of the flesh. Verse 13, he says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Okay, so note the word if. Okay, only if you live by the flesh, you will die. Okay, so this is the same warning that Paul has mentioned earlier uh, in the chapters and uh, or in his letter, and he has, been, uh, he has mentioned this earlier, and he's again reiterating this for us now. And then he says, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the believers by the spirit. Uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, can put to death the deeds of the body, which means they can put to death the sinful, evil desires of the body. And what is the result? That they will live. Okay. So he's saying this is how believers live victorious over the flesh. Um, and how do they live victorious over the flesh? It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, because the law of the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin and death. So again, uh, remember the law means the dominion, the power, uh, the influence, the authority of the spirit, you know, sets us free. But the dominion, the power, uh, the influence, the authority of um, sin, you know, produces death in us. Okay, so that is the meaning of law. When you're talking about the law here, law of the spirit of life, law of sin is not talking about the Old Testament law. Verse 14, he says, you know, um, verse 14, he says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So he says, all of us who are sons of God are led by the spirit of God. So, you know, um, if you are led by the flesh, then you are not led by the spirit, okay? Um, if you're not led by the flesh, but by the spirit, then, you know, the spirit produces life. But if you are led by the flesh, then you do what the flesh tells you, 
and ultimately it's going to produce that which means it's going to produce corruption decay you know weakness uh, all kinds of sickness and uh, disease so it says we are led by the spirit which means that the holy spirit says whatever the holy spirit says we do wherever he leads we follow whatever he tells us we obey him and we do uh, what it asks us to do, which means we are in total subjection and submission to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Verse 14, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, again, he's bringing a contrast here. He's talking about the spirit of bondage and the spirit of adoption. So the spirit of adoption is a spirit that puts us into um, captivity, okay, into bondage, into captivity, into slavery. But the spirit of adoption is the spirit that brings about sonship. Uh, and because we have the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit attests to us that we are sons and daughters of God, that we belong to God, that we are heirs of God, that we are co-heirs with God in his kingdom. You know, uh, hence we can call God as Abba Father, okay? Um, a more um, a personal relationship that we can have with God. So Abba Father is something more personal because in the Old Testament, we know that God, people did not have that kind of a personal relationship with God. They were more in fear of God, fear of his curse and fear of, how he's going to smite them or how he's going to punish them and also so much of fear of god that they would not even take the name of yahweh on their on their lips you know or on their on their mouth so they uh, speak about it so they had alternative uh, names like jehovah for yahweh so we see that you know here uh, uh, when jesus came he brought about a personal relationship with uh, God and man saying, you know, God is our father. He's not just a God who's there to punish us, but uh, gives us rules and regulations, but he's a God who is a God who, you know, um, uh, is having a personal relationship with us. He's, he's our father. He's gracious, compassionate, merciful, and forgiving and kind. Also, we see a new title uh, for the Holy Spirit here. Um, what are the uh, titles of the Holy Spirit given here? Spirit of life, spirit of Christ, and the spirit of adoption. So in these verses that we saw, the preceding verses as well, we see new titles for the Holy Spirit. We see he's a spirit of life, the spirit of Christ, that is um, verse um, uh, 10. We, we see him as the spirit of um, uh, Christ. And also that he is a spirit of life. We read that in uh, verse 10. And here we see that uh, another new title is a spirit of adoption. Okay, So the Holy Spirit does not put us in bondage or slavery uh, or does not keep us in fear. So anything that brings about bondage and slavery and fear is not from the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Holy Spirit brings us into this wonderful place where we have freedom, we, have, we are liberated sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. Okay. So the spirit of adoption uh, releases us to be the children of God, which means spirit of adoption means the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, uh, attests or tells us, hey, you know, that we are now brought from darkness to light. Uh, we are no longer slaves of Satan. We are now uh, sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And he reminds us of who we are in Christ. The spirit of adoption releases us to be children of God. Okay, So this helps us understand what is the work of the Spirit and what is not the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the Holy Spirit is a spirit of adoption. He liberates us and if we are children you know we have this wonderful privilege of being heirs of god and joint heirs with christ jesus any questions so far before we move to verse 16 any questions any doubts
Okay, verse 16 says, um, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, and verse 15, he says, we have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So how can we cry out, Abba, Father? Because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit, which means the Holy Spirit bears witness in our spirit man. So, you know, he's unveiling to us the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Paul is here unveiling uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. He says we are led by the Spirit. And now he's saying that the Spirit bears a witness with our Spirit that we are children of God, okay, or we are sons and daughters of God. And he says the Spirit himself bears witness, which means the Spirit himself uh, testifies or it means the spirit himself is speaking affirmingly or the spirit himself is speaking convincingly to us about who we are in christ what is our position uh, in christ or where we are brought out from and where what is our standing um, today so he says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit which means the Holy Spirit is testifying, the Holy Spirit is speaking affirmingly, he's speaking convincingly, and where is he communicating it to us? Where is the Holy Spirit com communicating to us? He's communicating it to us in our spirit man, okay? So here we see that, you know, the Holy Spirit does a lot of things. Uh, we've been reading this chapter, we've seen the Holy Spirit work, um, you know, doing a lot of things. It says he's a law of the spirit of life, that helps us to overcome the flesh. It says he's a spirit of life that gives life to my mortal body. And also verse 11, we saw that. And he says he's a spirit of life who leads me. Okay. So in Romans chapter 8, Paul is basically unveiling to us many different facets of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. He's a spirit of life who speaks to me. He bears witness to my spirit. Um, one of the, uh, and one of that we see in verse 16, it says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit, which means he's testifying, he's speaking, he's giving evidence, he's giving us conviction. And in this particular place, uh, the witness or the conviction that he's giving to us is that we are the children of God. So if anyone asks you what is your birth certificate, you know, you can show them this as your birth certificate which is your birth certificate mm -hmm. romans chapter 8 verse 16 okay romans chapter 8 verse 16 says you know um uh, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god okay so that is your spiritual birth certificate okay so the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of god so you can say, I know that I'm a child of God because the Holy Spirit bears witness in my spirit. Okay. So basically in these verses, you know, Paul has been talking about the whole dimension of the, the life and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. He's basically explained to us the work of, uh, uh, the, work of the spirit of life in us, the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit in us is giving us um, life. Uh, the life-giving spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Uh, and the law of sin and death, what Paul refers to earlier in chapter 7, uh, and he says that sin that controls the members of our body and that which is the byproduct of sin reigning in our body, you know, we are, uh, the spirit gives life to that. Uh, the law of sin and death is done away with. And he says the Holy Spirit sets us free from the control of sin, the power of sin that controls our body and death, which is a byproduct of sin reigning in our body. Okay. But however, Paul continues to say that we need to be spiritually minded, not carnally minded, because if we are spiritually minded, what is the result? Life and peace. But if we are carnally minded, what is the result? Death. Okay, and then he mentions that the Holy Spirit indwelling in the believer helps us to put to death the sinful deeds of the body. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, he says, we should be able to subdue sin and sinful deeds in our body. Okay.
Okay, and then verses 16 and 17, he says, everyone is a child of God. Those who are led by the Holy Spirit are children of God. And the Holy Spirit bears a witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, so if we are the children of God, you know, we have this wonderful privilege of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Okay, so let's look at verse 17. Where it says, and if children, then hairs, hairs of God, joint hairs with Christ. And if indeed we suffer with him, we will also be glorified together. He says, and if children, he puts us in the esteemed and uh, uh, in an honorable position that we are hairs, that we are hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ. So now Paul is using the, the kingdom of God terminology. He's using kingdom terminology. And he says that, hey, you know, you and I are heirs or we are successors. This is who we are. Who are we? We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. So he says we share with Christ. We share everything with Christ. And uh, even though we share everything with Christ, he does not mean that we are deity. He is deity. But all the benefits of what Christ has accomplished or what Christ has purchased for us or redeemed for us on the cross, that Paul has conveyed to us in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And he's saying all this is what we share uh, as a result of what Christ has done or Christ's work on the cross or what he's purchased for us on the cross. So he says we share in his righteousness because he has become righteousness to us okay or we share in his authority because he has raised us up and made us seated with the, with the father so we are co-heirs with christ jesus so this is what he has spoken to us in romans chapter 5 6 and 7 okay now the latter part of verse 17 it says if indeed we suffer with him we will also be glorified too together okay so he says if we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together which means even if we suffer we know that we will be glorified why because we are heirs of god and joint heirs with christ so what is the suffering that paul is mentioning here you know the suffering he's mentioning here is the suffering which he has already mentioned in verse 13 which is put to death the deeds of the body. So this is a suffering he's mentioning. He calls it a suffering because this is not easy. You know, putting to death the deeds of the body is not easy. So it's, it's a kind of suffering that we are going through. So people suffer on the earth. Uh, they go through all kinds of suffering. They go through persecutions, challenges, hardships. But the suffering in verse 13 is not referring to hardships and challenges and persecution, but the suffering in verse 13 is to put to death the deeds of the body. Okay. Now, which is as a cross reference, go over to First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Can somebody read that, please? First Peter chapter 2, 4, verses 1 and 2. Can somebody read? Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So here he's talking of a different kind of suffering. He's talking about suffering in the flesh that causes us to cease from sin okay he says hey look at jesus how he suffered so you also must be willing to suffer so in this case you are suffering because you are seizing from sin okay uh, so this is what it, he's saying that you know seizing means coming you know uh, to an end you know, ending from sin or terminating sin or stopping uh, from sin but in romans chapter 8 verse 17 you know, one of the aspects of suffering is putting to death the deeds of the flesh so that we can cease from 
sin. So he's saying, you no, know, when you put to death the deeds of the flesh, that's when you can terminate sin. That's when you can stop sinning. That's when you can, you know, uh, come to uh, a place where, you know, uh, you are ending or stopping uh, to sin. So he's saying, you no, know, when you put to death the deeds of the body, it's going to only cause you, you know, to put, um, to come to an end to or cease from uh, sin. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, you know, one of the aspects of suffering is to put to death the deeds of the flesh so that we can cease from sin. And Paul adds that if we suffer, we know that we will be glorified together. Okay. So this putting to death the deeds of the body is going to only cause us to be glorified uh, together, which means to walk in glory of being an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. Okay, so what is the glory that he's talking about here? It means that, you know, the glory of being a heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. So he's saying that, you know, putting to death the deeds of the body is going to only cause us, you know, to be glorified together, which means to walk in the glory of being a heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. So how do we walk in this glory? We walk in this glory by being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, which is a glorious position. How do we all continue to walk in this glory? It says if we suffer, we will be glorified too. Get them, okay. So, uh, and I, what I'm saying is, in the immediate context, of course, there is a future glory that we will uh, enjoy. You know, where we would, um, uh, you know, where there will be no suffering, there will be no pain, there will be no power of sin, there will be no sin at work. But here we see that if we suffer, you know, we will be glorified too. Get them. So, for us to walk in the glory of being heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. What do we need to do? We need to put to death the sinful deeds of the body by the Holy Spirit. And that is the key. Okay, So that is the key. So you can ask, why are believers not able to live as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? It's because we are not willing to put to death the deeds of the body. Okay, So the Holy Spirit who lives in us, the Holy Spirit who lives in our lives and who's a spirit of adoption makes us children of God in the spiritual realm and he has also made us heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. Okay, so all this is in the spiritual realm. This is our spiritual identity. But this is what we need to live out as a physical reality, as a physical experience, um, something that we need to make a uh, uh, evident in our lives and how do we do that we need to be willing to put to death the sinful deeds of the body okay we'll stop here and we'll continue um, on friday anyone has any questions any questions okay so we'll stop here just uh, to reiterate you know um, just uh, soak into Romans chapter 8 verse 11. Declare that God is giving life to your mortal body and also that you need to put to death the sinful deeds of the body and the Holy Spirit is going to help you. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good day. And a hello, ma hello ma good morning. Ma yes, good morning Abu Baker. Good morning. Ma uh, uh, yes, ma Please ma, I, I mixed the assignment. Okay. Obviously, because of the situation of around our area here. So we don't normally have light all the time. So that is why you don't used to see me, me online. One minute, Abu Baker. Can I just um, stop this recording so um, the e-learning students don't have to listen to this and they can...